This week and next, we will survey two of America's very worst human products. Two of the people whose personalities and ideas are so offensive that historians have scarcely known what to do with them. Next week, it's Hinton Helper, but for today, we go to George Fitzhugh, who so loved slavery and the planter regime, he was so entranced by its callbacks to the Romantic Middle Ages, and he was so convinced that slavery was both natural and just that he even advocated that poor white people be enslaved. Some historians have gone so far as to say that George Fitzhugh stands virtually alone in American history as the one major figure who seriously departed from Lockean political philosophy and even modernity itself. To examine this bizarre and frankly disturbing thinker, I've invited historian Phil Magnus back on the show. You may remember him from a while back when we spoke about his recent book, What is Classical Liberal History? But for now, we have to turn to the very opposite of classical liberalism so we can see just how bad it gets. Welcome to Liberty Chronicles, a project of libertarianism.org. I'm Anthony Comegna. All right, so Phil, can you uh, start us out with just a bit of biography on George Fitzhugh? I mean, you know, I, <laughs> I'm wondering, I don't know too much about his personal details um, of his life, but I'm wondering what sort of life does somebody have to have to come out as terrible as George Fitzhugh was? Right, right. And Fitzhugh is a classic eccentric. And uh, you can kind of see that in the way that uh, he focuses on his writing. So he's obsessed with slavery, uh, but his background is kind of this oddball that um, he, he's self-taught mostly. He has a little bit of formal education, but he's uh, uh, a deep reader of books, uh, has a massive library reportedly in his house, and he would uh, um, kind of descend into uh, just intellectual engagement with all the material that he could swallow up. Uh, so. He is an autodidact in that sense. He's trained as a lawyer, uh, and he actually marries into a modest amount of wealth uh, with his wife. That uh, so she brings an estate in, and the estate has uh, uh, basically a couple slaves and a very large uh, mansion in uh, Port Royal, Virginia, which is where he ends up uh, spending most of his life. Uh, but all his contemporaries uh, report him as someone who kind of withdraws from social scenes is often found sitting around in his library in his house uh, absorbing books. Uh, he does a, a variety of odd jobs throughout the years to bring in little sources of income, including working for the federal government. Uh, at points, he would uh, serve as a judge or offer his services as an attorney to various uh, government actors, and this persists from the antebellum period through uh, the Civil War, he goes into the service of the Confederate government, and then after the Civil War, uh, oddity of oddities, he actually uh, does a little bit of legal work for the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, although he's still very much in a, um, a hostile perspective to uh, uh, the freed blacks uh, after the war. But uh, you, you can think of him as just a, a bit of a dilettante who uh, moved from odd job to odd job, had enough money to uh, to basically survive and descend into his books. And then just over the years, he takes up pamphleteering and pamphleteering moves into journalism. Journalism moves into uh, publishing these more uh, substantive works. So he comes up with two books over the course of his career. Uh, and I guess we can get into some of the content of those. Um, but one thing I will say that, that keeps coming up as a theme over and over again of people who meet him is they always remark on, on what an odd character he is. So uh, one of the classic stories is he lived in this, uh, this massive mansion that uh, was inherited through his wife's family, and he apparently allowed it to just go into shambles, never kept it up. And uh, observers, visitors would come to see him, and he'd be sitting there reading his books, and there'd be like bats flying out of the attic and stuff. Uh, and he's apparently unfazed by this. So uh, just a classic uh, type of an eccentric character. And I think that really frames some of the intellectual uh, direction his life takes. That fall of the House of Usher type <laughs> scenario is, is yeah, pretty great. Yeah. <laughs> what, a, what a perfect analogy to the whole slave system itself and Fitzhugh's yep. medieval outlook on the world. Um, now, right, now right. just a couple points of clarification. Was he ever at any point what would be considered a planter? 
Uh, so it's uh, he's definitely not like a uh, a plantation style uh, manager of the South. He uh, I think the best records we have is through his wife's family. He has maybe nine or ten slaves uh, at any given point, but uh, he uses them mostly for domestic servants uh, and smaller tasks like that. Uh, so in terms of actually doing employment, uh, most of it comes from either uh, odds and ends that he can gather from writing or uh, just service as an attorney from time to time and usually uh, falling into various uh, political patronage jobs. But that also puts him in the largest class of slave owners in the South, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the small slave yeah, owners. Yeah, he's very much, yeah, yeah, so very I, much so. What kind of impact do you think that had on the development of his ideas, the fact that he's somewhere between a uh, normal person, uh, like like uh, as we'll see, somebody that fits you would actually want to be enslaved, whether they're white or black. Right. Uh, he thought he thought everybody should who was poor basically should be a slave to somebody who was wealthier. Right. So he's in the middle. Um, I, I wonder what yeah. effect does that have on his thought? Well, uh, he he certainly sees himself as kind of like the paternalistic patriarch of the household. Uh, his view of slavery on a personal level, his relationship to slavery is almost always emphasizing uh, the role of servitude is kind of a, a uh, guiding mechanism, as perverse as the sound, to the moral life. He, he sees the, uh, uh, the master as someone who provides order for those that uh, in their natural free state would just be in chaos. And it's very much a hearkening back to kind of a feudal lord with the serf underneath him type of a, um, a view of the structuring of society. And he draws very heavily on that. He's almost obsessively reading about the medieval era uh, whenever he can get books on that subject. And he sees slavery as almost a, a direct descendant of that and a modernization of that. What kind of literature – did he like to read? Was was he reading Walter Scott and you know romantic poets, uh, or did yeah. he stick to outdated <laughs> old literature from the period that he loved so much? Right, right. Uh, so off the top of my head, I, I haven't seen any references directly to uh, to Scott, although that's that's certainly a uh, 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 something that's in the air of the old South. Uh, the romanticism of, uh, of uh, you know, medieval times, Ivanhoe, that type of stuff. Uh, I, I can't say with certainty to the degree that uh, that Fitzhugh drew on that. And, and actually most of the reading that he cites and references is of a nonfiction type uh, with one very clear exception we can get into. And that's uh, he, uh, he is obsessed with Thomas Carlyle, who is both a fiction writer and a historian. And he sees these uh, Carlyle's fiction as, as very compatible with Car Carlyle's philosophical and historical writing. Now, this obsession with the medieval world and with with the patriarchal elements of of serfdom and uh, lordship really, really fascinate me in Fitzhugh's thought because I find it some some of the it's some of the most challenging elements to a libertarian because. I, I think especially with the influence of somebody like Hans Hoppe and his book Democracy, the God that Failed, like we, we do recognize that democracy in all sorts of ways is a step backward from certain things about medieval life. And then there are also the left libertarians who point to you know, the, the king's corporate charters as the growth of capitalism or um, – enclosure by the aristocrats and you know, medieval life was a lot more free and libertarian in a lot of ways. And you know, free libertarian peoples could live alongside the world of lords and serfs who are bound to the land. Um, so there's, you know, there are all sorts of challenging elements in in Fitzhugh's presentation of the medieval period uh, as this this grand time of great patriarchs. Um, so I wonder if you could just fill in what is his intellectual heritage. Yeah, so it's uh, it's mostly self-taught, and I'm actually glad you, you go in this direction. I almost see Fitzhugh as kind of the anti-Deirdre McCloskey. Um, and Deirdre's whole thesis is about an emergent uh, cultural intellectual shift that occurs that breaks uh, humanity uh, effectively out of the serfdom master relationship. It's the uh, the dignity of the merchant class that's emergent. And uh, whereas McCloskey would celebrate that as something that uh, 
um, opens up uh, new opportunities for people that never had them again, opens up new freedoms. Fitzhugh looks at this and sees in horror that it's like this uh, instrument of chaos that's happening. Uh, it's upending the order of society. Uh, so as he's kind of doing his intellectual journey, his, uh, putting together his, uh, his theories, he's drawing on whatever he can grab onto as uh, kind of a claim of institutional uh, stability that he can pull from the past. And yet the oddity of it is he merges this with, uh, with some really radical political economy. Uh, so some of the other references that you find throughout his texts over the years, uh, he's very well read in uh, the socialists and utopian communists of the era, the pre-Marx uh, uh, end of the radical left. So people like Robert Owen um, is a, um, a very frequent reference in Fitzhugh's work. Uh, so he's almost merging this idealized uh, study of medieval history with uh, radical political economy that's coming out of the far left and saying that the two unite very uh, uh, symptomatically uh, uh, of the modern industrial age. They unite in ways that uh, particular authors, say in the communist socialist world, or particular authors in this reactionary hearkening back to the old um, idealized medieval state would not recognize of each other. And he sees himself as kind of this bridge figure between the two literatures. So let's let's dig into what he thought was so admirable about the feudal system uh, and, is, and also Catholicism, which I find yeah, also yeah. strange. It's, a, it's an outlier uh, from this period for somebody to have so much effusive praise for the Catholic Church and its hierarchies. Um, but right, but right. Fitzhugh definitely does. What did he find valuable about the feudal relationship? Well, it's a, the hierarchical structure. Um, it is a paternalistic way of looking at life. Uh, so, and this is where Fitzhugh draws something very strongly from the left. His economic theory is all about worker exploitation. It's all about... Uh, looking and seeing the lower classes of society. Uh, obviously, the slaves are, are, are the, the foremost example in his day, but he sees white laborers as also exploited. And his uh, vision of kind of the relationship of those, those laborers to capitalism, he sees them as com uh, almost captive to this exploitative system in a very proto-Marxian way. And he sees the older feudal system as a displaced parent, something that in a previous age would have protected these people, uh, would have also provided order uh, to their lives and done so with a strong hand. Uh, so he, he's very uh, uh, accepting of the brutality of the system, uh, but he sees uh, the master-slave relationship as, the, as very analogous to the, uh, uh, the Lord-Surf relationship. Um, he also sees this as something that... Uh, is directly parallel than historical religious structure. So there's where Catholicism comes in, uh, being a hierarchical church, uh, being something that is ordered around uh, very clear relationships from the Pope on the, all the way down to the bishop to the local parish priest. Uh, he sees this as a structured ordering uh, that can step in and almost offer that paternalistic guidance to the uh, uh, the, the chaos of uh, of life unchained from uh, from any sort of institutional border. So uh, to him, Catholicism, it's not so much a religious attraction that pulls him in that direction. Uh, he looks at the structure of the church. He sees a centralized body with uh, diffusing rungs of order beneath them, and he sees that as a proper uh, way to uh, disseminate moral instruction. Uh, very similar to uh, the way that a properly situated lord or uh, or nobleman would disseminate moral instruction to the workers that are underneath him um, on his farm or his estate in uh, medieval England. What what were his what were his religious views? I mean, so, were his yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, you yeah, know, you read his books and you, there's a uh, yeah. um, a matter of sincerity that's always at play in Fitzhugh. And he'll go through some of the nods from time to time in his journalism and his writing uh, to indicate, uh, uh, you know, appeals to Christianity in, in, in a very vague sense. But you're never quite sure uh, how serious he is. Uh, he doesn't seem to be an overly religious man. Like he's not uh, visibly praying out in public or any of that uh, that type of thing. He makes uh, references to it. He's well read 
in elements of religion and theology. Uh, but there's always this question of the of sincerity. Does he view this as as a true belief? Probably not. Does he view this as a uh, a, a tool that's very compatible with his uh, his way of looking at the world and one of many possible tools? So uh, uh, something that's very parallel to the uh, uh, the nobleman serf relationship as well. Uh, that's more likely the case, at least uh, how I'd interpret it in um, in viewing him religiously. Yeah, I, I kind of had the same sense. He seems sort of like a like a Straussian in that um, he might not really believe the things that he's saying, but the myth is more important. It's important that you believe that he believes what he's saying, you know? So he, he might not think a word of this Christianity Bible stuff is is true, but that's not important because it has social power to it. And that's what he's concerned about managing, like a good patriarch. Um, oh, absolutely. And it's a uh, – and even before Strauss, and I, I don't want to malign them too much, and, uh, and others uh, have a complex uh, view of the Straussians myself, uh, interesting political philosophy. But uh, this is a Carlylean theme as well. Uh, if you look in Carlyle's text, he's constantly the trickster, and he almost takes joy in, um, in playing with words, in uh, uh, playing with concepts, in not quite – fully revealing his deck of cards or his hand of cards to the world. He's not showing his true belief so much as he's taking concepts and using them to prod the reader in a certain direction. And you're never quite sure what is the true personal Carlisle coming through or uh, what is, is actually just uh, wordsmithing and uh, uh, conceptual use to try and drive a conversation in a direction he wants it to go. And Fitzhugh absolutely picks up on this style. Uh, he's almost an outrage artist. He he glorifies and uh, himself and the fact that his writings provoke such a um, a vicious backlash in the north. He he almost relishes in it. He's unusual in this sense uh, compared to the other pro-slavery writers. Uh, they view themselves as the enemy of the northern people. Uh, they view themselves as someone who would never associate with a Yankee. Uh, Fitzhugh is almost the opposite of that. He wants to associate with the Yankee so he can kind of throw himself into the ring and batter them around uh, with as outrageous of, uh, of a uh, proposition he can put forth and just to see their reaction. So he absolutely loves that publicity that he gets from it, almost like a 19th century version of an internet troll in a sense. <laughs> You know, so I want to come back to this thread later, but it strikes me that he's also very familiar or very similar to Sir Robert Filmer in his writings, which mm -hmm. it was John Locke's great enemy. Um, right. And, you know, it's been it's been commented that uh, Fitzhugh was the one person in American history who genuinely preferred Sir Robert Filmer to John Locke. And I mean, it seems to me that throughout Filmer, you also get somebody who doesn't really seem like they believe what they're saying, but they got to make the case the best way that they can. And so they'll use evidence that they think people will find convincing. Um, right, right. What, one of the themes you see in both of Fitzhugh's books, and you see several of his journalism outputs, is he's constantly bashing, beating up on Locke. Uh, he sees Locke is, as kind of the fountainhead of both a political philosophy that tears down feudal, feudalism. So he's actually concerned more so with, with Locke's first treatise in this sense than a second treatise. The first treatise is the one that, uh, that digs into an attack on the divine right of kings. Uh, we kind of see it as antiquated uh, as uh, co uh, compared to the social contract that comes out of the second treatise on government. But uh, Fitzhugh dislikes both of them and he tears into them constantly. He views Locke as the destabilizing political mechanism of the old feudal order. But he also views Locke as kind of the fountainhead of this market thinking that he despises. Uh, so he sees a, a direct trajectory, an intellectual trajectory from Locke to someone like Adam Smith, who is the other great enemy that emerges in his work. Uh, you take someone like Filmer, and actually Fitzhugh does not refer to Filmer all that much. Uh, so it, it, it's it's something that historians have commented on. They've recognized a, uh, a parallel in their way of thinking. Uh, but what it comes out as is, uh, you know, Filmer adopts this paternalistic outlook, uh, very similar. He's a defender of the king, the monarchy, and uh, the successive orders of society as providing moral instruction, providing order to the world. 
so Fitzhugh, in a sense, is almost copying and updating that way of thinking. Uh, you know, this is a, um, um, a late 17th century type of a doctrine. He's saying, well, we can take it to the 19th century, and oh, we have uh, this modernized system of slavery that's our next state in the, kind of the historical evolutionary trajectory. Uh, so use slavery as the paternalistic mechanism uh, that sustains this type of, uh, of ordering and moral instruction for life that's been displaced by the evils that he sees in the Lockean system. And it's not, I mean, he does really hate philosophers. He, he's, he's not, uh, he makes no bones about that. He, he really has contempt for philosophers. And it's interesting to me that he seems to have much more high regard for historians. Um, right, like, like right. Carlisle, yeah, and Carlisle first and form, foremost among them. Yeah, and I mean Marx, who was first and foremost a historian, right? I mean, right. even though he's right. remembered for some god awful reason as an economist, um, yeah, he's really not the worst historian from his era. So you know, <laughs> there's some yeah. value to yeah, him well, there. There's a low bar there, but <laughs> <laughs> that's true. But you know. Um, he there's this divide in in Fitzhugh. He he hates philosophers, but he loves the down to earth uh, historians who get into the the details of human experience and all of that stuff. Really makes a difference to his way of thinking. Um, now I back to Locke though. That time period of enclosure and people being displaced to the countryside, the rise of wage labor, the rise of Lockean philosophy. That's the beginning of chaos for him and kind of this mid – this messy middle period in history in between you know, grand patriarchies of the feudal period and the slavery period. Uh, there's this awful, mucky, free society period in between. So tell us about, about Fitzhugh's idea that free society is a failure. Right, right. And th this is where kind of the – Fitzhugh is the anti-McCloskey comes – into full view. Um, he sees horror in uh, the opportunity that's uh, afforded by uh, especially economic freedom, but freedom in general. Uh, he sees nothing but uh, a disruption and overturning of the old system and with it a moral breakdown that comes out. Because remember, his, his core theory is that the feudal lord not only provides order to society, but provides moral instruction down to people who uh, he sees as almost, uh, um, you know, free and wild when left to their own devices, and he's horrified by that. Uh, so he, he views the Lord as someone providing moral instruction. He sees the slave master as someone providing moral instruction there. So this is kind of a uh, uh, an ethical view that sees emergent, uh, I guess we, we call it capitalism today, but really a market system as ethically destructive. Uh, so the antithesis of almost anything that a, um, a modern libertarian uh, theorist would uh, would refer to when talking about the, uh, the the inherent morality of free exchange, Fitch you sees this as, as kind of the complete destruction of morality. So uh, there's that tension at play. He is um, historically minded in the sense that uh, he's obsessed with reading accounts of what's going on in the ground. He he almost prefers this to anything in the fictional world. Uh, so he studies accounts of factory conditions in England in particular. He looks at uh, accounts of political upheaval. So he's, he's quite fond of Carlyle. Uh, Carlyle's big work is his history of the French Revolution. So uh, Fitzhugh is reading that, absorbing it at the same time, uh, seeing this is kind of a, a way of peeking into man's soul is to look through uh, historical accounts. Uh, one of the oddities of his study of um, industrialization is he draws on quite a few of the same sources that Karl Marx does about a decade later. And C. Van Woodward, uh, the, the great historian of the South, uh, who edited a series of, um, uh, actually put one of Fitzhugh's uh, books back into print and did a very uh, critical um, interpretive essay of it. Uh, he points out that Fitzhugh's uh, analytical process of, um, of studying factories, st studying worker conditions through historical documents is almost identical to the process that you find in Karl Marx. And on top of that, they reach um, more or less the same conclusion with their own uh, individual twists at the end. So um, the approach is very uh, 
uh, similar to Marx. The material he's using is very similar to Marx, and quite a few of the conclusions are the same. Yeah, I mean he uses the very first chapter in Sociology for the South to attack free trade and that's 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 where the he builds the rest of his case from there. Um and you know there's the this very very important line from there political economy is the science of free society and socialism is the science of slavery. Talk to us about that a little bit. Right. And uh, so, so this book comes out. It's his first uh, major tract. He's been writing journalism for uh, a couple of years before that and put forth uh, arguments in favor of slavery. Uh, but the, the title is The Sociology for the South. And the, uh, the subtitle of the book, though, is almost more fascinating. The subtitle is The Failure of a Free Society. Uh, so take that in for a moment. What's he referring to is the failure of a free society. He's actually referring to market capitalism or what we'd call market capitalism. He's referring to uh, the the Manchester emergent school of free uh, trade that's coming out of the United Kingdom. So uh, he doesn't go into uh, so much by name attacking someone like uh, uh, Richard Cobden, but that's very much in the political air. Uh, so 1846 is when Britain repeals the Corn Laws. It's um, its entire protective system that had upheld uh, high tariffs effectively on food items uh, in the United Kingdom. Yeah, so it's a, a protectionist mechanism to sustain large landowners in Britain uh, by keeping them uh, in farm production, even though Britain's uh, a really inhospitable climate to uh, uh, to grow uh, wheat and corn and, uh, and farm products. But uh, the idea is to sustain that market. Well, Fitzhugh views this, uh, this emergence in, in human history, this uh, introduction of free trade is something that further destabilizes the landholding class. It's kind of the, uh, uh, the last death blow against uh, the old estate uh, holders of the uh, the feudal medieval order that had remained in England. Uh, because if you look at what the effect of protectionism was prior to the repeal of the Corn Laws, it actually kept several of these large estates uh, relatively profitable internal to England through artificially sustained uh, agriculture prices uh, caused by the tariffs. And uh, you remove that, what happens, trade enters in, uh, more efficient, more effective uh, production mechanisms in better climates and far flung regions of the world start competing with those old landowners and those estate holders in England. It makes them no longer profitable. Uh, there you have an entire collapse of the, uh, the last remnant of the feudal holdover. So he sees free trade as, uh, as one of the greatest threats of modern society in his age. Uh, he sees Manchester liberalism is breaking down uh, the very last remnants we have of feudalism. He also sees it as uh, being in direct competition with the system, the economic system he's espousing based on using slavery to supplant and restore uh, the feudal order uh, for a very specific reason. If you go back to economists uh, from Adam Smith forward that are writing in that era of classical economists, almost all of them touch upon the problem of slavery. And they do so through economic reasoning. Uh, there's also moral cases that Adam Smith makes, but uh, Smith's major famous contribution on slavery is he notes that uh, you know using a Cedars Paribus uh, assumption, slavery versus free labor, they're put side by side. Free labor will outcompete and be more efficient than slavery because there are certain incentive structures in place. Uh, if you're a free laborer, you have an incentive to improve upon your product, improve your skill sets. Uh, maybe innovate, offer something new that, uh, that makes your productive process more efficient. If you're a slave, what's your incentive? It's uh, do your work or you're going to get whipped at the end of the day. And uh, Smith is arguing that one is a driver of efficiency, the other is it's kind of this retrograde politically sustained system. So uh, Fitzhugh sees this um, Smithian philosophy as directly antithetical to the slave order he wants to uphold. Uh, sees it, but he actually declares at several points and says uh, the, these market thinkers are at war with slavery. Uh, they view slavery as something inefficient to be driven from the market. I view something, uh, I view slavery as something 
that uh, is the sustainer of order and moral instruction in the society. So he sees the two systems as entirely incompatible. And this really becomes uh, kind of the fountain of Fitzhugh's exploration into market theory, uh, which he views as totally destructive to everything that he believes. Uh, so that's why he really starts out with um, attacking free trade as the uh, uh, the forefront of the enemy of the anti-slavery enemy that he's going after in his book. And it is right there on the very first page. It's the first chapter is this tirade against free trade, but it's also a theme he carries through to his other works. Uh, he actually argues for an elaborate kind of mercantilist price management tariff system to be imposed uh, and sees this as the alternative mechanism to industrialize the South. And after industrializing the South, what you do, you use the slave labor system uh, to sustain and fill the uh, the worker positions in that industry. You know, I, I love that you say he's the anti Deirdre McCluskey because uh, what what he said, what he had to say about Benjamin Franklin also really leapt out to me. He said, Franklin was the best exponent of free society. And he says his sentiments and his philosophy are low, selfish, atheistic, and material. And you know, Franklin is looked at as one of the best representatives of American bourgeois values and virtues. Um, but it's it's this constant competition that so bothers Fitzhugh. You know, he sees the medieval world as a, a world of universal cooperation because everybody knows their proper place and everybody is in it together. And the world of the modern period is one of constant uh, competition of everybody against everybody. It's you know Hobbes's state of nature run wild over the whole planet um, with no end in sight either. I guess until everything burns down and people like him build it back up with their slaves, right? Um, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, he says a competitive free society is a race to the bottom. It's a uh, destruction of order, and, and you have Franklin, who's someone who's like the champion of uh, of self improvement. Uh, Franklin is someone who's basically the champion of the self made man of uh, this uh, this more egalitarian philosophy and uh, equality of opportunity um, as a mechanism to improve yourself, uh, to seek out your best industry, to seek out your best task. So, so Franklin is someone uh, who's at odds with the the Fitzhughian. Uh, outlook on society where you have order provided by someone tells you, well, you're a serf. This is what you do. Uh, here's your instruction on how to be a good serf to the best of your ability. Uh, so the, the, there's a very clear tension there. It, it also doesn't help that Franklin of the founding generation is one of the more anti-slavery figures. So uh, uh, there's a very obvious tension there between uh, what fits you wants as a uh, an ordering basis of society versus what Franklin Kind of writes into the fabric of the American tradition as uh, as having a um, uh, you know freedom is at odds with slavery uh, uh, outlook and philosophy. Now, throughout uh, sociology for the South and Cannibals All, um, he compares people to all sorts of different kinds of animals. Um, he says that we should have societies more like bees and ants where their social structures are sculpted by nature and not sort of in, created by society itself uh, and the choices of individuals and according to their preferences. No, we should have it given to us like, you know, through the genetics of sort of like bees and ants. He says that, you know, he, it's interesting where he does not discriminate in the way that we might think a 19th century pro-slavery author would. Um, he's not racist in the ways that we think he might be racist. He's not sexist in the ways that we might think he would be sexist. He is both of those things, right. but not the way we would no, think. Right, right. So like he says – he, he he's, well, he says both – <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's very he, strange. So like for example, he says both the, the Anglo-Saxons before the Norman Conquest and Native Americans were in pretty much the same – social situation. They were more like, he says, Bengal tigers than men. Um, he also uses other animals like owls, wolves, lions, cattle on the pampas, horses, oxen, sheep. And he says, good slaves are like faithful dogs. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, but, it, but it's not a race. It's not an issue of race for him. Right. 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 Yeah. He, and he, it, I, I guess to, to clarify, so, um, Fitzhugh is absolutely racist in the sense that he views 
uh, black people as uh, kind of inferior in their evolutionary uh, origin. Uh, he, he constantly refers to black people as childlike, uh, but he universalizes the same type of a sentiment. Uh, so Fitzhugh's odd in the sense he, he argues that slavery can be extended to the entire society. Uh, he argues that slavery, uh, though racial in its ordering in the South, and he sees that as proper, uh, so he, he, uh, he adheres to a racist vision in the sense that he sees uh, black people as kind of the equivalent of the, of the drone ants or, or, or drone bees, the very lowest rung of the colony. Uh, and there are absolutely racial prejudices that lead him to believe that, but he also sees um, other people in society. He also sees other workers, including white workers, as uh, potential subjects that can be enslaved. Uh, he actually talks about, in some of his texts, he gets into very odd theories where he says the, uh, uh, the proper Southern gentleman, the proper Southern uh, landowner or aristocrat uh, could give similar um, instruction uh, of such a nature that would even redeem the Yankee children. And uh, he, he goes through uh, kind of this elaborate scheme. He says that uh, despite, uh, so he hates the Yankees, he hates Northerners, uh, sees them as uh, intellectually corrupted by this philosophy of freedom, uh, intellectually corrupted by other things. But he says, you know, e even a Yankee child, if put into the proper instruction of slavery at a young age, could be brought up to be a, a productive and uh, um, a contributing member of a slave society, a contributing member of a, a factory. And he sees this as kind of a moral redemption to Yankeeism that he's always railing against. Uh, but he's very much talking about white laborers as well as being subject to slavery. So uh, it, it's taking a lot of the prejudices of, of his era that were uh, uh, other theorists would apply to black people and do on racial lines. And he does accept uh, that element of it, but he tries to universalize it as a, um, an ordering system for all of society. It strikes me as very similar to the way he handles uh, feminism which was another one of the crazy radical isms that he saw springing up everywhere in free societies and you know it's interesting because he says women should be subordinate to men but he also praises them for their distinctly feminine virtues he talks about how the turk and the chinese uh, venerate women as idols and they bind their feet and destroy their bodies as a way of worshiping them and that's a good thing um and he talks about how you know good slaves have feminine virtues, and I mean, <laughs> it's enough to make me wonder where he'd fit into a modern BDSM scene. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I'm more interested in to what degree are modern academics now doing George Fitzhugh's work for him in making oh, socialism <laughs> and slavery popular again together? Right. Right, uh, and it's almost unwitting in this. And so I make this argument along uh, economic lines. So economics are, is the clearest area where Fitzhughian philosophy has almost subversively survived. And the reason for this is because he's so close to Marx. Uh, he has this very hierarchical, uh, paternalistic outlook of social ordering, which tends to get him cast as like this conservative reactionary type. Uh, but his political economy is outwardly radical. It's um, proto-Marxist in nature. He, uh, you know, we've already talked about. He, he considers slavery as the purest form of socialism, and he says this over and over again. And then when he, you get into the particulars, if you were to ask Fitzhugh, how would you design an economy for the South? He'd say, well, we need price controls and tariffs. We need uh, state intervention into the industry, subsidy, uh, industrialization program, something that uh, you, you could very much see fits you in another century uh, being kind of like a Stalin character or an advisor to Stalin who has a five-year plan for industrialization of, uh, of um, the sector of the economy. Mandatory uh, public education, right? <laughs> right, right. Uh, and, he, and he's hinting in this direction in some of his commentary on industrialization in the South. He sees the South as uh, – virtuous in its acceptance of slavery, but deficient in its failure to mobilize uh, its economy in a managed industrial direction. So he has this entire system of central planning that he espouses, uh, and he sees this on a very communistic basis. 
one of the things he's constantly railing against is wage slavery. He uses terms very much uh, in uh, in ways that we could recognize uh, a, a Marxist today doing it. Uh, so he's talking about the industry of the North subjects people to wage slavery. Uh, it does so by alienating them from the product of their labor. So here, here again, we have a, uh, a, a Marxist uh, doctrine that enters into the equation. And, and probably uh, the most pronounced parallel is he develops a theory of exploitation, uh, a theory of capital based on exploitation. He, he sees capital ownership, uh, capital ap acquisition is kind of a theft, an exploitative theft of the product of the laborers. Uh, so it's straight up leading into a Marxist-like system that he's planned out as his explanation for the economy he sees around him. Now, his prescriptive solution is slightly different, I guess you could say, than uh, uh, than what a Marxist would go to today. They don't advocate slavery for very good reason unless you are uh, considering something like enslavement to the Soviet state and the hardline Stalinist version. But, uh, but fits you, uh, his diagnosis is a very left-wing political economy. And what this does in his own age, especially the uh, writing in the late 1840s, early 1850s, uh, when he's kind of at the height of his influence, uh, he's diagnosing the industrial problems of the South as a deficiency of central planning. And what you have today, uh, this is where I draw the parallels. I, I'd argue that uh, Fitzhughian political economy has almost been unwittingly reinvented and adapted, minus, of course, the uh, the overt celebration of slavery. Uh, but Fitzhughian political economy of uh, viewing this era as industrially deficient and subject to wage labor exploitation. Uh, this is something we've seen in a whole genre of the historical literature is referred to as the new history of capitalism. It's popped up in, say, the last 10 years or so. And what you have is these modern theorists that take this uh, take Marxist precepts. A lot of them come straight out of the, uh, the political left, and they're very sympathetic uh, to all the building blocks of the Fitzhughian system minus slavery. So uh, they view uh, diagnostically uh, the industrial si situation of the mid 19th century almost identical. It's a uh, situation of uh, uh, labor exploitation. Uh, they see slavery introduced into this as a, um, a further continuation of that exploitation. So there's the break from Fitzhugh. And then foremost among it is they see the Southern economy and especially the uh, uh, crops like cotton as the building block and driver of the industrial world. So um, the late antebellum was famous for its introduction of something known as the cotton thesis or the king cotton thesis. Everyone learns about this in uh, even like high school history books uh, of Southerners who see uh, the cotton is industry as the core driver of not just a, of their own regional economy, but the world economy because textiles come from it. It's a, uh, a major component of shipping, a major component of finance is devoted to uh, the production and sustenance of cotton. And the idea that the Southerners had at the time was that if you disrupt the cotton trade, if you break down the plantation system, it'll send the entire world economy into uh, basically a depression or an economic collapse because they thought cotton was that important, that central to everything that uh, uh, world economic production would depend on it. Uh, Fitzhugh's very sim uh, sympathetic to this kind of an approach in the sense that he sees Southern productivity and output is a major raw material building block for this industrialization scheme that he wants. Uh, and what we've had is modern uh, historians that look at uh, the, uh, uh, the economy of cotton and the economy of slavery in the late antebellum um, have actually fallen very susceptible into kind of believing the nonsense, believing this, this notion that cotton was indeed what all these Southerners were, uh, were touting it as and uh, as the central building block of the entire world economy. Um, so they've almost unwittingly uh, revived an element of the King Cotton thesis and uh, used it as an interpretation of economic history minus the enthusiasm for slavery that you'd find in someone like Fitzhugh or his other contemporaries. Uh, so it's a really odd development in the, uh, uh, the modern literature. Uh, but so what, even to the point you could uh, you could go into Fitzhugh's book, like the Animals All, where he lists all of his uh, industrial prescriptions. He lists all of his ideas of, of what you do to fix the economy. 
of the self and you put it side by side with uh, some of the diagnostic uh, claims of uh, late antebellum uh, uh, economic health by someone like Sven Beckert or Ed, Ed Baptist, and they're all talking about the same things, industrialization schemes, tariffs, managed trade, uh, centralized economy. Uh, the only difference being that uh, you go to someone like Fitch, you have the enthusiasm for slavery. You go to the modern theorists, and they, uh, they very obviously hate slavery. Uh, but the economic diagnosis is uh, almost identical. Well I'll, well, I'll agree with you that I think modern day historians definitely hate slavery. But let's also, uh, <laughs> let's also close by remembering what Fitzhugh himself said about uh, government. All government is slavery. Right, right. And he absolutely loved government, uh, absolutely loved slavery. Uh, yeah, that, and um, you know, I'll add on that, that note, uh, Fitzhugh does continue writing after the Civil War. And it's mostly in what we consider the equivalent of an op-ed today, so short journalistic pieces. And uh, there, there's kind of been this, this tendency in the history profession. They see Fitzhugh as very timed to the late antebellum Civil War era. Slavery is abolished, and he kind of fades off into the distance. Uh, no, that's not true at all. Uh, he actually continues writing, and he keeps picking up on theme after theme after theme of railing against uh, the uh, uh, the philosophy of a free society, railing against the deficiencies of government action in that free society, and railing against the failure to uh, to properly order and uh, and control and design an economy around it. Even now that slavery's uh, gone by the wayside through uh, uh, emancipation and the Civil War action, uh, so he he still clings to this um, this philosophy even to the extent that he actually starts celebrating elements of the state. He says, you know, if they're going to be capital owners, it might as well be the state that's the capital owner because that's the true slavery in society. This is how we can have slavery after slavery or some, some of the benefits that he saw in slavery after slavery itself as a formal institution had been abolished. Phil Magnus is a senior research fellow at the American Institute for Economics Research. And I wanted to close with a bit of historiography. Lewis Hartz was that historian who famously argued that all of American political and intellectual history has been based on John Locke. He said that the Lockean consensus was so vast and sweeping that socialism never really had a chance here. He identified George Fitzhugh as the lone outsider in all of American history who genuinely preferred Sir Robert Filmer to John Locke. But something about this strikes me as deeply wrong. Consider just how much Fitzhugh said that is now echoed by mainstream academia, or even some of the things he said that libertarians would love, like remember that line, all government is slavery. In fact, it seems that Fitzhugh spoke for the progressive future, and much of 20th century thought, while it was not based in Fitzhugh, he did prefigure it, and that is a deeply disturbing prospect. Liberty Chronicles is a project of libertarianism.org. It is produced by Tess Terrible. If you've enjoyed this episode of Liberty Chronicles, please rate, review, 